Anaheim Winter Nam 2015, and uh, I'm lucky enough to sit here with Tom. Gosh, thank you so much for spending some time with us, Tom. Well, thank you very much. And, and uh, so, we, what what are I, we here for? I'm really here for that guitar right there. That's that's the guitar. Okay, I worked with Les for 45 years, and I was his luthier, sound engineer, co-producer. Also did a lot of inventions with him and just was a very good friend. He was like my second father. I worked 27 years on Broadway with him and I did the, the production on the Iridium and also even worked on uh, a couple of videos that he did too as well as the uh, Les Paul's uh, video which was called, uh, it was done in 1988. That was a great video. The man had changed the music. That's what it was. Man had changed the music. The man had changed That's music. a fact. Yes, true. And uh, of course a later video too. Chasing Sound, which was the big, big one. That was great. You know what I've always heard, Tom, was uh, good Good people always carry smarter people around them. That's correct. <laughs> and, uh, oh, boy. So, anyways. Well, you're flattering that's, me. Uh, well, that? that's true, though. That's well, true. Well, thank you very so, much. So, uh, how, how did Les and you guys become friends? It's a very interesting story. I'll make it pretty quick. Generally speaking, I went to see where Les lived when I was about 18 years old. I was inspired by him so much that I was driven to find out where he lived. And I won't tell you exactly how I found the address, but I did, <laughs> okay? And then we get to the area where he lives in Mawa, New Jersey, and one thing leads to another. And I tell my friend who was driving, I didn't have a license at the time. I was 18, 17 and a half. And uh, so we go to where the house would be, but there was a gate, you couldn't get in. So one thing led to another, and I said, look, there's another road that goes up behind that area, a little small mountain, the Ramapo Mountains. Up there was a Boy Scout camp. So we were up there and I got binoculars. It kind of fits Tom, right? Peeping Tom. <laughs> One thing leads to another. I said, if a car pulls up behind, there's only seven houses there. If a car pulls up with a guitar player getting a guitar out of a car, we know we got the right house. Now in 1960, there weren't too many guitar players. So that was the reasoning behind it. Now, one thing leads to another and I say, I just saw this car pull up behind that house and he pulled the guitar case out of that car. Hmm. Let's go down there and see if that gate is open and we're gonna go try to see where that house is. So we do, the gate was open. I decide to tell my friend, I said, I'll remember what the house looks like because of the Listerine commercials. They always showed the house, huh. in front of the house. So I got it in my head. If we see that house, we're pulling in the driveway. We pull in the driveway. One thing leads to another. My friend is scared stiff. I said, I'm going to go knock on the door. He said, are you crazy? I said, no. I go knock on the door. <laughs> no one comes. I knock on it again. Door opens up. There's a gentleman standing there with a hammer in his hand, penny loafers, a ripped t-shirt, uh, rolled up uh, actually jeans also. And he says, can I help you? I said, yeah, I'm a friend of Les Paul's. He says, really? He said, what do you do? I said, I'm a guitar player, of course. He said, you do? You play guitar? I said, yeah. He said, well, what's your name? I said, it's Tom Doyle. I said, but Les knows who I am because I stop by here every month when I'm traveling. He said, he does? I said, yeah, he, I, you do, I should say. I said, yes, I do stop here. He would know who I am. So he said, well, I'll tell him. Closes the door, we get in the car, I go back home. I said, too bad, Richard, my friend. He wasn't there, it was just one of the workers there. Five years forward, 1965, almost 66, someone sends him a telegram about my sister and I who were doing a Les Paul and Mary Ford tribute. With multiple tracking, Ampex tape recorders, we're doing all that stuff. And he gets- Very innovative back then. Yes, it was, it was. And he gets a telegram from this woman who loved us and explained that you gotta come and see these kids. Lo and behold, my sister are doing Bye Bye Blues, eight tracks behind us and two more tracks on top of it. We're playing live. My sister played rhythm guitar, I played lead, and she sang great, all the parts. Get done with the song. He, this man way over in the corner is clapping like this. Gets up and starts walking towards us. Hi, I'm Les Paul. The same guy I met at the door of the house. He said, you guys are great. He says, uh, how did you get that sound? I said, well, I'm triamping. I've got woofers, horns, and tweeters. And I'm running that through all those amplifiers to make that sound as crystal clear as I can make it. 
He said, well, that's great. He said, I want you to come to the house tomorrow. Into your house tomorrow? Yeah, I want you up there. I'll, don't come Don't come before 3 o'clock, because that's when I get up, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> so we go up at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and here I am with my sister and I, Susan, her name was. It still is. And uh, he's showing me everything, how he produces records, how he records his guitar. Play my guitar. Whew. This one was there, too. And I says, play it. I said, okay. And he says to me, he says, well, I got to take you downstairs in the cellar. I want to show you what's, I, you know, I retired in 65 when Mary left me. Mary Ford had, had, had less had a divorce. He said, but I want to show you some guitars downstairs under the kitchen in the cellar. So we go downstairs and there's water dripping. All kinds of problems with pipes and these guitars are being destroyed by this water. That's Paul's house. You're right. And he says to me, well, you mean, I said, Les, you can't have these great historic guitars. All right, you take that one home, you take that one home, fix it up, I want to see what you can do. Huh? Now you can imagine, this is probably within a week or two of the time I first met him. Take it home, see what you can do, clean them up, make them play again. Les, are you serious? Yeah, I'm serious. He just trusted you. And that was the beginning of working with him for those 45 years. And that was some of what I did, but that was the good part of how it started. That's so cool, so cool. Any other questions that you... Well, um, tell us yeah, tell us about the uh, Doyle coils. Okay, Doyle coils, very good question. Uh, my partner, Max Stavern, and I collaborated on developing humbuckers that would be what Les would like. He never liked Gibson humbuckers because they were muddy on the bottom end. Muddy on the bass strings, okay? And he said, you know, so he, Gibson would send a guitar over at the Iridium or Fat Tuesdays and he'd try it out. We would record that guitar, then we'd re record a guitar that he was using, and then we'd compare notes. And he said, well, it's not making it, right, Tom? I said, no way. So that went on for quite a few years, and right up to the, about ten, about eight years before he passed away. So he was trying to develop a better humbucker. I knew that. I was helping him with that. And he said to me, he said, you know, I got to give up on this thing. It's just never going to work. And he said, you know, I'm beginning to get tired, Tom. He's about 93 now. And um, I said, okay, Les, I understand. It's a tough one to solve that problem. So when he did pass away, I had a lot of his notes and scribbles. And he would take, <laughs> he would take, you know, he didn't do this in a notebook where it would be like a real ledger. He'd take scrap paper and scribble on schematics and numbers and size wires and turns and all that stuff. So I got a lot of that stuff. And Max and I started deciphering by re-engineering what he was after. And then we worked for three years almost on developing the Doyle coils. And to clean up that bottom end, and we're getting rave reviews now because of the pickup sounding so wonderful for being in the humbug. How can people find these pickups? They can find them right on the internet at, at Doyle Coils. If you look up Doyle Coils, it's on the internet, and you can purchase them right there. DoyleCoils.com? That's right. That's yeah. right. Yep. Are you still, um, I, I was reading, me and my uh, cohorts here were reading an article, and you were playing at the Iridium with Sandy? Yes, my wife Sandy, We what when Les passed away, uh, the, the trio was still there. That's with Lou Paulo, and and uh, uh, we had Nikki Parrott playing bass, and we had uh, John Coliani playing piano. And they can, and Lou Paulo playing guitar, and so they continued the uh, the trio playing there for for a couple of years. And Lou asked me, "Come on up, and would you open up the show with your and do some songs by Les and Mary as one guitar, one voice?" And my wife and I would do that. People would be looking, "My God, we feel like we're getting chills." It's just like Les and Mary when they were a duo. Because that sound I had, I developed my own guitars, my own pickups to create that sound. Studied them so much. Oh, most of them. So much. It, yeah. It was like wearing uh, his sweaters, you know what I mean? It was just, I, I just knew what he was made of. My mentor, Carl, he was a big um, Les Paul and Mary yeah, Ford oh, fan, oh, too. Oh, yeah, sure. So. Well, it was were, the 50s. Oh, yeah. 50s. Well, he, well, Les was the greatest of all time. You have to realize, I, I saw him play when I was seven years old. By nine, I began to understand what was going on by listening to his jukebox records. And so from that point on, I was hooked. That was it. Yeah. You know? And so that sound was what I wanted to get. 
and everybody wanted to get the Les Paul sound. It wasn't until rock and roll came in where it changed the world, you know. And people like Bing Crosby and Les Paul and Mary Ford and many others, Patti Page, they were out because the new world was developing their own sounds and trying to create what Les said to me. They're, try they're trying to do what I try to do, but it's in a different world today. Yeah. Hey, uh, one last question. How can people research the story on this? What, what episode or what edition of the uh, Guitar Player magazine was it? It's the February issue, which is out right now. Okay. And it's uh, the, one, the most wonderful article that I could have ever been a part of because they interviewed me so distinctly, and I told them I would not do an article unless it was done correctly and not just, uh, uh, I, I, you know, fluff. This is the real thing. If you do that, I'm with you. If you don't, I'm not. And so between Max and I, we developed a rapport with Mike Melinda, who was the chief editor, and this went on each word, each sentence, and everything we went over with him until it came and rang the way it should. And we told a lot of people about what Les did and how it, it came about with a tech, a tech who interviewed me also. And uh, that was a great part of the article, where I give size wire that he used on the pickups, how many turns, cool. you know, all this kind of stuff. Not in total depth, but at least you never heard this before. And, right. And so people have been coming today just swamping me with, you never heard about this stuff. And thank you for that article. And I, I thank Mike Melinda and Max for doing a great job on this article. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, thank you very much. Tom, thanks for your time. Thank you, Joel. It was good meeting you, sir. Thank you, Joel. Yes, sir. So